And so far, we've dealt with a lot, a lot of common errors in English. And they've been so, so, so informative so far. And we're going to take it um, steps further today in this class. My name is Jesse Josh. The next one we're going to be looking at is the word envelope without an E and the word envelope without with an E. So, first of all, let's look at the pronunciation. We have envelope and envelope. One of them is a noun, and the other is obviously a verb. Um, when something is enveloped in something, um, that thing is covered with another thing. That's what it means to envelope somebody. Now, this word does not have an E, but the noun is an envelope, something a brown or white piece of paper, um, you know, made in a way that you can put in a letter, you know, or, or um, cash in it. So that piece of paper, brown or white, that you can put money in or put a letter in is an envelope. However, someone or something can be enveloped in something or another thing, okay? So um, envelope and envelope, right? A noun and a verb. The next one, handwriting on the wall or writing on the wall. Now, this is a Bible allusion. When we say allusion, we are referring to, allusion is referring to significant people or books, you know, what they stood for or what they said. So, this is an allusion to the Bible where um, Daniel was called to interpret the writing on the wall. Well, some English speakers have now added their own. Some people call it handwriting on the wall. Some now say writing on the wall, which is correct. Let's look at it. When we talk about writing on the wall or handwriting on the wall, I remember that when we started off on common errors in English, one of my major focus or one of the things I said was that most or a significant part of common errors in English, especially in Nigeria, is as a result of the, um, the contrast between American English and British English, all right? So we see a lot of errors because we hear something, we watch a lot of movies, and then we hear Americans speak in a certain way, and then we hear British or the Britons speak in a particular way, right? And there's usually a conflict or a contrast between both of them. Now, the problem is, as regards what we are talking about, handwriting on the wall is more American, and so, if we're going to be grammatical, um, we have to go with the British version of this word, which is just writing, no hand in front of it. The Americans say handwriting on the wall, but British say writing on the wall. As a Nigerian, you should say writing on the wall. However, what does this idiom mean? When you say, hmm, I saw the writing on the wall, so you are saying that you foresaw that something bad was going to happen about a particular situation as regarding something or someone, okay? So, you say, oh, I saw the writing on the wall. That would be the right thing for countries that were colonized by um, the British, all right? However, if you want to go the American way, it would be correct to say handwriting on the wall. So, both are correct. They are just on two different levels or two different standards of English, all right? Next one. Have no choice or cannot be choosers. Now, it's correct to say you do not have a choice. But, and it's also correct to say you cannot be choosers. choosers. However, one of them is an idiom. So, there's an idiom that says beggars cannot be choosers. Right? If you're the one asking for something, you don't, have, you don't really have a choice to make. So, if you are referring to the idiom, right, you have to stick with what the idiom actually says. Beggars cannot be choosers. Or, um, you know, um, what, what else can we say? Um, yes, let's just, stay, let's just stick with beggars cannot be choosers. Um, that is as regards the idiom. But if you are going to just talk in plain speech, you can say, I do not have a choice. Do not refer to the idiom and say beggars have no choice. That would be wrong, grammatically. Because idioms are not following the normal rules of grammar. So just stick with idiom. If you are talking about the idiom, stick with the idiom. If you are talking about um, plain speech, stick with the plain speech. So you are right if you also say, um, young man, you do not have a choice in this matter. That's fine. But if you are going to talk idiomatically, just say, 
you cannot be, we cannot be choosers as regards what is going on. All right? So, if you have a car or you take public transport, you should listen to this. Hold up, go slow, or traffic jam. Hold up, go slow, or traffic jam. Um, which of them is correct and why? The word go slow was actually invented by Nigerians. Um, so, Nigerians have actually found a way to put, you know, traffic in levels. So, some people talk, we talk, some people talk about hold up, some people talk about traffic jam, and some people talk about go slow. Actually, grammatically, as regards using the Oxford Advanced English Dictionary, the word go slow does not exist. So, Nigerians actually made up that one, right? So, if you're going to talk about, you know, your car being stuck, you say, we are stuck in a hold up or traffic jam along Ibadan Express Way. So, a traffic jam is a traffic jam, a hold up is a hold up, but there is nothing like go slow. So, please, leave the go slow alone. <laughs> All right. The next one we're going to be looking at is hot and heat. Hot and heat. Hot and heat. He could feel the hot of the sun. Hmm. And he could feel the heat of the sun. Now, hot is an adjective. Okay? And the word heat is a noun. The fact that they are of different parts of speech means that they cannot be used in the same situations. Okay? So, um, hot can only be used, um, you know, in the place of, in, in places where adjectives can only be used. So, you can only say, the sun is very hot. Right? But then, you can only also say, I felt the heat of the sun. So, hot is a, an adjective. Heat is a noun, and so you can only use it where nouns and adjectives can be used. Let's, once and for all, let us settle the idea of handsome, pretty, and beautiful. Okay? Now, the first thing you have to know is that the word beautiful, in British context, in British context, cannot be used for a guy. So you cannot say, Jesse is beautiful. Right? You can only say Jesse is good looking or is handsome, right? Um, however, the Americans, um, especially for little kids, if the boy is a little, little kid, um, mothers have a way in the American, you know, territory of calling their boys beautiful. So I've heard in American movies, my beautiful boy, right? Um, but in the British territory, that does not apply. Handsome only applies to guys, and beautiful also applies, only applies to ladies. Now, the word pretty, um, people have argued over the years about the difference between beautiful and pretty, and cute. Somebody say cute, beautiful, and pretty. Now, um, just probably use your English dictionary. Like I said, no two English words mean the same thing. These words are not exceptions. So just use your English dictionary, and you'll find out the difference. Of course, um, they said pretty is someone who is not beautiful but has very, very distinct facial features. Do you get? So, um, you know, just look at the, at the dif look up the, dic the, the difference in the dictionary, right? And you surely see a difference between the two. However, handsome can only be used for guys and beautiful can only be used for girls. Good looking, however, can be used for both guys and um, ladies. So I can say Nini is looking... Or Nini is good looking today. And I could, I could also say Jesse is good looking today. It works for both guys and ladies. Hang off or hang up. Hang off or hang up. Now, this is another prepositional error. And we're going to trash it right now. In this sentence, I remembered what I had wanted to say, but I had hung off. I had remembered what I wanted to say, but I had hung up. Now, hang up is the thing you know, and it is actually the correct one. But I've actually heard people say hang off. Hang off is not, um, um, 
you know, grammatical. So we have, I hung up the phone, right? To hang up means to put to an end a telephone conversation. Okay, so the right thing to say is, I hung up the phone, not I hung off the phone. It's easy to mix them up. But if you know that some prepositions cannot be used with some words, then it will be much easier to not make mistakes. So it is hang up and not hang off. All right? The next one we're going to be talking about is hail or wave down. Hail or wave down. Now, both wave down and hail can actually be used to signal to a vehicle to stop. Right? However, the word hail is not common, but is regarded as more official. I know people rather say wave down. People don't even say wave down. They say, I stopped a vehicle, right? Uh -huh. But the actual thing to say is, I waved down a vehicle or I hailed a vehicle. However, people don't know the word hail or they would rarely use the word hail. So they use, I waved down a vehicle. Both of them are correct. It depends on the context. So if it's a more formal situation, use the word hail. Less formal, wave down. Splitted or splits. Splitted or splits. Now, this word splits, S-P-L-I-T, has, um, how do I say this? The word splits does not have a different past tense or past participle tense. Splits is split in the past tense and the past participle. So, the word splitted is wrong, grammatically wrong. It does not even exist, right? So, um, um, the teacher has splitted the class into groups. Wrong. The teacher has split the class into groups. Correct. All right? So, splitted is wrong. All right. There is a difference, even though people have failed to put that into, you know, consideration. There is a difference between fiancé and fiancé. They are even spelled differently. Fiancé is spelled F-I-A-N-C-E and fiancé is spelled F-I-A-N-C-E-E. -E. Now, um, your fiancé is the man you intend to marry and your fiancé is the woman you intend to marry. So they are both different. For the guy, it is called fiancé and the, uh, for the girl, it is called fiancé. Alright? I keep correcting people about this, but it seems like not, not entry in their head. So, fiancé is F-I-A-N-C-E. -E. That's for the guy. And fiancé is F-I-A-N-C-E-E. -E. So, the fiancé is for the guy. So, fiancé is the guy you intend to marry, and your fiancé is the girl or the lady you want to marry. So, please take notes. The difference is one E for the guy and double E for the lady. All right, so people that want to get married, please note so. <laughs> <Brad says. laughs> ah. All right, next one we're going to be looking at is for C or for C. For C or for C. Now, the first one is F O R C E, sorry, F O R S E E. And next one is, or the other word is F O R space S E E. Let's look at it in a, in a sentence. Do you foresee any problem? No space. And do you foresee any problem with a space? Now, the word foresee does not have space. The right word is foresee together. Foresee as in F-O-R, no space, S-E-E. -E. So you don't have for space C. That's wrong. So do you foresee any problem? That word is together. They are not separate words. Fleet. Ah. You hear a lot of Nigerians say this word. I want to fit my room. I'm sorry you have said it. I'm sorry you have said it. You that you're looking at me, I'm sorry that you have said it. I want to fit my room. Now, I don't even know the spelling of the flint you're even talking about. Is it F? I've yet put it. I want to flint. Is it F L I N T or F L E E T? The only flint I know, F L E E T, is used to group a collective noun for the name of a group of cars. So you have a fleet of cars. That F-L-I-N-T, maybe it means something, flint, I don't know. But when you regard, when, when you're talking or you're using those words, when or to describe spraying insecticide in your room, you are absolutely wrong. Absolutely, absolutely wrong. You don't flit or flint your room 
you fumigate your room. It might sound like a big word, but that's the correct thing to say. So I fumigated my room, not I flit my room or I flint my room, whichever word you use. Okay, so um, when you take an insecticide and spray, or if it doesn't even have to be an insecticide, you could use powdered, you know, forms of, you know, you know the whole things you use to, you know, trade away bacteria, insects, mosquitoes, and all those, right? So you could fumigate. Once you do that, you are fumigating your room. Find versus recover. Find versus recover. Example. The, the, police, the police eventually found the stolen car. Or the police eventually recovered the stolen car. Actually, these two words can be used to, um, when talking about getting something back that was lost, stolen, or missing. However, it is more appropriate to use recover, right? Uh -huh. Because sometimes when you find something, you did not previously have it. But when you recover something, you are saying that you, you previously had it, and then somewhere along the line, you lost it, or you misplaced it, or you went missing, so you recovered it. But when you use find, um, there's a possibility that you may or may not have had it previously. So it is much more appropriate to use the word recover than the word find. However, the word find is not wrong to use, okay? So, but it's just better and more appropriate to use the word recover. Now, look at this phrase, free for all fight or free for all. Now, look at this sentence. Um, the election results resulted in a free for all fight or the election results resulted in a free for all. Note, it is a redundancy to say free for all fight because free for all is already or it means a noisy fight so what you'll be saying if you add fight to be it will be a noisy fight fight right which is wrong it's grammatically wrong that's a redundancy right so a free for all is a noisy fight so the election results resulted in a free for all a free for all is a noisy fight so do not say free for all fight a free for all is a free for all okay all right we'll bring this class to a close and then in the next class we're going to continue on more common errors in English. My name is Jesse Josh. I'll see you in the next class. Mm -hmm.